It's important to understand how maps are made, or at least what are some of the basic design elements, because it's through those design elements that a map maker shows his bias or tells his story. For example, projection. Projection is the way that you take the information from a sphere and you transfer it to a flat piece of paper. One of the oldest projections is what we call a Mercator projection. And it, in essence, is taking a flat piece of paper and wrapping it around the globe so that it touches the globe at the equator. So then if you have a source of light right at the very center, it will project outwards. And as you move to the north and the south pole, those areas will be exaggerated. One example is the Wright Moxon map of the world done in the uh, early 1600s. If you look at it, you'll see the information along the equator is fairly accurate in terms of uh, shape and size. But as you move towards the North Pole, Greenland and Northern Canada become greatly exaggerated. Another element to consider when you're looking at maps is the decoration and the symbols that are used on a particular map. During the 1600s and the 1700s, maps were elaborately decorated. And you look at them and you might say, were they just trying to make the maps look pretty? Or was there some symbolic meaning to the representation? A 1630 map of the world by Jodicus Hondius it has images in each of the four corners of the four cartographers who were major geographers throughout history. But at the bottom, center, there is an image showing three people worshiping somebody on a throne. Those images are the personification of the continents. Europe is seated on the throne, and the other continents, Africa, Asia, and America, are paying homage to Europe, which is a very symbolic of the worldview uh, in the 1600s and the 1700s. In addition, as maps became more scientific in the 19th and 20th century, symbols were used to portray geographic information. These could be lines for roads or railroads, points or little town profiles for cities. But um, also map makers started to invent pictorial uh, symbols. For example, Matthew Fontaine Maori's whale chart, which was published in the middle of the 19th century, uses whales spouting uh, water uh, to show the location of where the majority of whales were located. Another aspect to consider when you're looking at how maps are made is what are some of the selections that take place? First of all, what's the orientation of the map? In other words, what's at the top of the map? Is north at the top? If north isn't at the top, why isn't it? We have a lot of maps on our website, and some of those illustrate the different orientations of maps. Uh, there, one particularly good example and one early example is a 1482 world map attributed to Claudius Ptolemy. North is at the top on this map. This is what we expect. And that became the convention uh, for most map makers during the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. However, people are starting to question why is north at the top. Uh, a modern publisher has published a map called What's Up South, and the South is at the top. We like to show this map to school children. We say, what's wrong with this map? And they'll basically say it's upside down. But when you look at the What's Up South map, you start to notice that South America, Africa, and Australia are much more prominent than they would be if you were looking at a globe. Another aspect of selectivity is what is the center of focus of the particular map? Many maps have the Atlantic Ocean or Europe and Africa as the center point. Um, I like to show an example of a map from 1561. We call it the cloverleaf map of the world, and it has three basic elements, one for each of the continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. 
but in the center is Jerusalem. And realizing that Jerusalem is in the center, you learn as you study this map that it was included in a book of pilgrimages instructing Europeans how to take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So that was the center of their religious life in the 1500s. 